the Four Arts of Music, an introduction to the work of Forrest Kinney. Part Two, The Art of Improvising. Hi, I'm Forrest Kinney. Thank you for joining me. This video is about improvisation, how to learn it, and how to teach it using my various books. I'd first like to take a few moments to explain why improvisation is my favorite of the four arts, why I consider it to be so personal, so spontaneous, and so generally wonderful. First of all, it's a daily joy to sit at a piano and create fresh music. I mean, it keeps your practice fresh decade after decade. It's also a great way to develop a wide range of musical sensitivities and abilities. But I feel there's even a greater value to it that's not so obvious. In the other arts of music, arranging, composing, and interpreting, our movements and imagination are both directed by visual symbols. But when we improvise, the notes fade away. We no longer move in response to visual symbols, so something else comes in to take their place. We begin to be guided by tones rather than notes, by sounds rather than symbols, and by something else that emerges the more we improvise. We begin to be guided by inspired feelings, and these begin to direct our actions and responses, feelings that move like clouds and waves and tides. As we improvise, we dive deeper into those feelings and discover the life underneath the surface that we normally ignore simply because we're usually so preoccupied with remembering all those notes and playing them correctly. As we improvise over time, a river made of musical ideas and feelings starts to flow inside us, a river that can give us fresh music each time we sit at the piano. We discover a sense of openness and freedom in this way of music making and the sense that there are many paths we could explore and each way is different. All along the journey, we develop valuable musical skills and abilities, particularly the ability to listen deeply to tones. When reading music, we often listen to tones just long enough to confirm that they correspond to the notes on the page. Improvising encourages what I call deep listening, the foundation of artistry and creativity, because musical creativity occurs when we listen deeply and respond to tones in new ways rather than habitual ways. As we practice deep listening over time, we develop a much greater sensitivity to tones and rhythms and all the materials of music. To me, the mode of A-flat Lydian is like a field of lavender whereas the mode of E-flat Dorian is like moonlight illuminating a lake or ocean. This kind of sensitivity to the different qualities of sounds is the foundation for not only composing, but for enjoying music for a lifetime. I felt compelled to share the joy of improvising with every music student, and that's what's kept me sitting at computers far more than pianos for more than three decades, writing and rewriting books that would help others experience what I do when I improvise. But why did the world need more books on the subject? Why didn't I just use what was out there? Well, because of the way improvisation has been taught when it's been taught at all. Here's how improvisation has been taught in the classical tradition. Basically, you're first taught how to arrange something I explored in the previous video. So you learn to play tunes and then add chords to the melodies. Songs such as this one written by Bach were often notated with just a melody and some numbers above the notes to show the chords to play. This so-called figured bass was all the keyboard player needed to improvise an accompaniment. According to Bach's son, figured bass was the first thing he taught many of his students because understanding it was so essential for anyone who wanted to work as a musician. So, depending upon the chord symbols and on what the vocalists or instrumentalists were doing, you played the chords in various ways. You were basically improvising accompaniments. But improvising took another form. You were then encouraged to make variations on the melody each time you repeated it. Unlike singers, keyboard players don't have new words to keep the melody fresh on each repeat. So, they were expected to vary the melody each time. 
and according to the Baroque scholar Thurston Dart, those who didn't were considered to be very dull dogs. Melodic variations can roam far away from the original tune and become quite different melodies with the chords of the song providing the harmonic foundation. This way of teaching improvisation is very practical, especially for working musicians like Bach, who worked in churches, but it's very limited in terms of the musical styles explored. A bigger problem with this approach is that it requires a few years of study and practice of arranging before a person can accomplish all these steps well enough to even begin to improvise freely. Since the majority of music students quit lessons within the first two or three years, this means that few ever get a chance to improvise. Now let's talk about the main way improvisation is often taught today. If you take a class on improvisation at the local college, it's likely to be taught by a jazz instructor teaching how to improvise in various jazz idioms. Once again, we have an approach that is quite limited in terms of its stylistic range. While jazz is all about improvisation, improvisation is so much more than jazz. For example, nearly all the master composers from Bach to Bartok were master improvisers at keyboard instruments. Robert Schumann wrote in his diary that he improvised for six hours one day. Music is improvised in various musical traditions throughout the world. The classical music tradition of India, for example, is largely based on improvisation and aural-based teaching. It has an incredibly rich treasure of modes for melodic improvisation and rhythmic patterns for rhythmic improvisation. Another problem with the jazz-centered approach is that it's often taught in a very theoretical way rather than an intuitive, experiential way. In a typical approach, you learn to play 2-5-1 progressions in all keys with 9th and 13th chords. You are taught that a Dorian mode fits with a 2 chord, a Mixolydian mode with a 5 chord, and a major scale with a 1 chord, or a Lydian mode. And when you flat the 9 on the 5 chord, you play with a Mixolydian flat 2 scale, and of course you will probably also want to flat the 5 with the 2 chord and play a Dorian flat 5 scale, and play the chords in a chordal harmony by playing the 11th instead of the 5th in the 2 chord, omitting the 9th from the 5 chord, and playing just the 13th and the 9th in the 1 chord. Okay, now you're ready to just play. Just go with the flow. Ugh. Those who have taken a class in improvisation know that I'm not exaggerating very much. It becomes so much about thinking and struggling to remember so much theory and not about feeling, listening, and responding. And these are the essence of artistry. It's a strain to the brain rather than a delight. I've talked with too many people who just gave up on improvising after this sort of approach, figuring they weren't capable of it or the teacher told them to drill the scales and chords over and over, and then someday they would just magically be able to create something with them. And of course, once again, it's years before someone masters these materials enough to improvise freely and responsibly, so beginners can't improvise learning in this way either. I learned to improvise intuitively as a child, and so what I wanted is an approach that even children could begin in the first lesson an approach where students could play with simple patterns that are easy to learn and play, like finger painting with musical tones rather than paints. An approach where you could learn naturally and intuitively like children and animals learn, where you play to learn rather than learn to play. An approach that was intuitive and imaginative first and theoretical later like the way I learned to improvise many years before I began classical piano lessons. And I wanted a way that was not limited to jazz idioms or involved learning with clunky, unimaginative 1-4-5 chords, which is often done. I wanted students to be able to play music that was imaginative, rich, and inviting, where students could listen and respond to a kaleidoscope of musical tones and engage their imagination and feelings from the start where students enter different worlds of sounds, and so there would be improvisations titled Medieval Story, or Japan, Spain, Africa, Ireland, even a piece called Dangerous Tango. There would be classical musical styles that sounded like Mozart and his sister playing duets, and others that sounded like the minimalist music of today. 
there would be all sorts of jazz and blues styles, and popular sounds such as rock, new age, and folk, and musical patterns that evoke the feelings of a bright morning, or the power of a storm, or the loneliness of the sea, or the mysteries of the night sky. An approach where you could improvise with any musical sounds and styles, there would be no limit. I'd like to give you a brief introduction to what I call the pattern play approach, the approach I use in my various series of books. With this approach, improvisation is taught in a very different way than how it was traditionally done in the classical tradition or how it's done in most jazz books and trainings today. It lets people learn in an intuitive, creative way from the start. Since my first book was published back in 2004, this approach has become used and appreciated by teachers throughout the world and even incorporated into some method books, but I believe it's still not widely known or understood. I call my approach the pattern play approach, and it's used in all three of my series of books, Create First, Pattern Play, published by the Royal Conservatory of Music, and Pattern Play, my original self-published set, the following three videos explain each of these series in much more detail and explain the difference between them. Here I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the general approach. My various sets of pattern play books have well over 300 different pieces and all use essentially the same approach. The approach is a way of structuring play. Each piece is a different playground that invites a student to play and explore with sounds and each playground has the same guiding structure. How does a complete beginner learn to improvise? It's all about duet playing first. The teacher creates an environment of sound, a safe environment in which the student feels safe to explore and make mistakes without judgment. It's as if the teacher is creating a swimming pool that invites the student to just dive in. So what does the teacher play to create this inviting environment? For an example, let's look at a piece that can be used with a student learning to play a C major scale and do so with feeling and artistry. It's called Scales Dream of Melodies. The teacher's part, the musical environment, has two main parts, a pattern and a vacation. The pattern, marked with P, is a short repeating accompaniment pattern such as this. The pattern can be repeated as many times as you like. Repeat signs in pattern play books mean repeat as many times as you like. After a while, the repetition becomes tiring, so we need a contrasting environment. The vacation, marked with V, is a contrasting accompaniment pattern such as this. A teacher moves back and forth between the pattern and vacation to make long pieces, extended environments for improvisation. The pattern and vacation are short and simple, so the person on the bottom can quickly learn and memorize these patterns and be able to listen and respond to the student rather than be glued to the page. For the student's part, it's just playing with white keys, in this case, the notes of a C major scale. The student is always invited to play using a selected number of notes. This is important because 88 keys is just too many. On each page, there are suggestions about ways that the bottom person might vary the accompaniment in response to what the top person is doing. For the person playing the pattern in vacation, it's important to always keep in mind that you're not merely an accompanist, you're a co-creator. You're providing a responsive and changing environment, and so you will want to vary the pattern in vacation according to what the top person is playing. You're having a conversation. This is the natural way to constantly create with variations. And so, the pattern vacation and set of tones to play with, these are the only three ingredients you need to structure an improvisation. So here's a demonstration of how this might play out with this piece. So the teacher starts by playing the pattern, and then the student joins in, playing on white keys. Here comes the vacation. And now 
here comes the return of the pattern. Notice how I vary it. So this is a complete musical experience. And later, the student learns how to play the same piece solo. So they learn an accompaniment pattern for the left hand and a vacation, and they play in C major with their right hand. Now some students are ready for solo right away, but beginners often need months or even years of duets before they're ready to go solo. Thank you for watching this video. I wanted to end by saying that improvisation is not just a useful skill to have. It's a daily journey that we can take each day of our lives. I believe that one of the highest purposes of art is to give us a way to discover and express what makes each of us unique. As we improvise, we feel we're exploring a wild place inside of us, a place no one else has ever traveled before. As we improvise music freely, we find a sweet place inside of us. Though the music we make may not be as great as somebody else's music, it's just right for that moment. There is no place else we would rather be than right where we are. Enjoy creating.